Welcome to Milton and King's On the Wall podcast, where we engage in conversations with artists, designers, and more. We learn about their stories from their insights and success to their hardships. Today, we speak with Jacqueline Colley, a freelance illustrator, pattern designer, and printmaker from the UK. We hope you enjoy this conversation. If you do, please leave us a rating and review. Hi, Jacqueline. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? This will it be evening for you, right? Yes. Um, well, apart from being very inadequate with technology, I'm fine. Um, yeah, it's evening. It's dark already because Northern Hemisphere, it's cold and dark. <laughs> yeah. And you're just uh, in and around London, is that right? Yes, I'm in Hackney, which is East London. Okay. How long have you lived there for? Oh, a long time. Um, since 2011, I've lived in the house that I'm lucky enough to um, own my house with my partner. Um, and before that, we sort of lived in the area still. So we've always had our had our hearts in this area. Oh, nice. And you since you, uni, yeah. Sorry. No, you said uh, your partner. You recently got married, didn't you? I thought I saw something. Um, so it was pre-pandemic, but everything pre-pandemic sort of does feel quite recent because the years <laughs> since are just squashed, aren't they? Yeah, it's like those two years just disappeared, sort of. Yeah, yeah. So it was 2019. It was. Uh, I'm glad we did it then. <laughs> we were very lucky. <laughs> yeah. But so, okay, so but if you're fairly... Sort of newly married. <laughs> yes, yeah. So yeah, newly married, but um, we met in art school. So we've been together for about fifteen years or something like that. Oh wow! Yeah, that's, that's great. But and then, am I am I mistaken? Did you just have a child? A baby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got. I've now got a um, one year old, one one a little, little bit year old. Um, yeah. So pandemic baby. People got and, dogs or babies, right? <laughs> wow. So, well, congratulations on that. Thank um, you. That must be a whole new uh, experience that you're... Yes. Yeah, totally. Um, she's now doing a little bit of um, nursery, so I have a little bit more time to work, which feels um, like a good balance. But yeah, it's a, been a roller coaster of a year. <laughs> did, you, did you find it challenging at first with, you know, finding time to create and do yeah. your artist thing sure so my um my partner he did one day a week childcare, obviously helping on the weekends as well um but that that meant that I had one day a week to kind of keep in touch with creativity which was really good for me and helped me have a little bit more balance and now I'm up to three days a week so he still does a day and then She's in nursery two days a week. So it's a really nice balance now. And I'm very productive in those days. I now realize how unproductive I was before. There's no more uh, messing around on Pinterest. <laughs> well, I would, you know, it's it's a really, I think, um, interesting, I don't know what you call it, but it's like a predicament, I suppose, when I guess before you sort of have all the time in the world to noodle around mm. in your creative thoughts mm -hmm. and now that time is is limited so you're having to do you're having to be basically be i guess 100 percent productive mm. the moment those minutes begin yeah right? yeah there's a lot of pressure <laughs> to be productive but i think it's at the moment it's fine for me because i've got a year of backlog of ideas that I really want to do but I know it's going to catch up with me and I'm going to have had no time to sort of like you say noodle and think and be inspired and wander around an exhibition and stuff and I think I'm too in the kind of like doing mode at the moment because I have all these ideas that I want to um, capture but yeah mm -hmm. I think it will catch up and then I'll be like actually I need to just get inspired and not be productive productive all the time yeah, yeah so i guess when you're when you're not and you're sort of in mom mode and you know taking care of you know the household and that whole thing mm. i guess that's you have that time to think i yeah. want to i want to do this i want to do that i want to do this and it's like the moment you get that green light it's go yeah totally and i think the good thing about maternity leave like any type of leave that you take from work 
I mean, a change is good because sometimes you get this new perspective on things, like because you can step back and see things in a different way. Whereas when you're in it all the time, you don't have that much objectivity because you're just doing. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find, or have you found um, being a mom, has that changed um, your... I'm, I, I don't know if it necessarily changed your style, but has it has it affected you at all in any way that artistically that you are either becoming interested in different things or, um, you know, because I've, I've talked to some artists where all of a sudden they'd be drawing and creating a certain type of art and then all of a sudden they're doing nursery things, you know what mm, I mean? So yeah. has, it, has it changed your perspective at all or what you're interested in or the way you see an idea? Yeah, I think I think similar to those artists you've talked to, I think you probably start um, looking at nursery things and when you have a very sort of strong aesthetic, maybe there's not the things that you want there to be existing that you want to put on their wall or whatever. And um, I was doing a drawing the other day on Instagram and it was like a ticket and it said, love you to the moon and back. And it's just a sketch at the minute. And I had a few comments saying, oh, great art for a kid's room. And I've never really created art for a kid's room, but actually my art is very, um, like my wallpapers that I've done with you guys, some of them are very applicable to kids' spaces. And the same with my art. Some of it, it, it totally depends on the person who's buying it and what their taste is, but some of it would go in kids' rooms. So now I think I'm thinking about that more, whereas before I always thought about my customer as an adult, but now I'm mm -hmm. thinking about my customer, yeah, as a child. And actually before coming on this call with you, I was thinking oh, it would be cool to do some more wallpapers. And then I was thinking, oh, it would be cool to do wallpapers for kids. Remember? So I'm definitely thinking that customer is much more at the forefront of my mind than it was before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is, it's interesting how, how, how that will change. Mm. Um, but I mean, you're, you're, the way I would describe your art, it is to me like for, la you know, I apologize if this offends you in any way, but I find it just so very playful and fun and quirky. Oh, that's lovely. And, <laughs> that's you know, like nice. it's, it's, it's just, um, it is the, uh, I mean, it's the, the child at heart through an adult's eyes. You know what I mean? The, I, that's, that's kind of how I see it. It has that, um, that element to it. That oh, has that's that. nice. I'm going to steal that. That's really good. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my bike. You know, it's just very, very playful. And I, it's so fun. And, and, you know, everyone, you know, I talk to, you know, I, I'm into the social media of Milton and King. And mm. so I'm talking with customers all the time and just people that are, you know, putting it up and they post it to their Instagram and interacting with them. And, yeah, it's 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 always – I just, I just saw one the other day where she said um, – I'm putting Palm Springs in a Oklahoma bathroom or something. Mm. Why not? You know, yeah. um, it's just that sort of that one. Yeah. carefree. Do what makes you happy. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So I, I think it's great that, that, you know, I, that's what I love about um, your designs is just, they are just so fun and it gives, you know, adults as well, you know, if kids as well, but it gives adults who are, you know, making the, the decisions about what to buy, um, sure. it just gives them that sort of playful childlike outlet and, mm. and allows that to shine through. I think that's just so cool. Yeah, no, I like art for fun's sake. I definitely am not a conceptual artist or anything like that. I'm a designer more than anything and, and illustrate it, but I, I definitely am always drawn to what makes me happy, what makes me optimistic, and colour is a massive thing for me. Colour puts a smile on my face. So, yeah, colour and play, I mean, those are words that are on the wall in front of me to, like, rem remind me of what my um, kind of core values are with the work that I make. When did you start or when did you know that you had a knack for for art and for drawing and creating? Yeah, um, oh, hard to say. I've always been drawing. I mean, as a kid, I do, like, I draw the posters for me and my brother. We had, like, a... <laughs> A TV with a SNES, like a Super Nintendo, and I'd draw the characters. I'd blow them up onto big pieces of paper and then we'd stick them around the TV for our favourite. It was like Bowser and Super Mario and stuff mm -hmm. like that, so I'd, I'd do that. And he was my older brother, but he let me be in charge of this, which I thought was great. And um, I remember one of, one of the memories that really sticks out in my mind is um, I was going to school and my dad was dropping me off 
And I must have been about 11 or 12. And I think I was complaining to him that I was such a weirdo at school and I didn't fit in. And he so matter-of-factly was like, don't worry, one day you'll go to art school and you'll fit in. And I remember just being kind of not really understanding. And it's funny that he said that, but I think he had aspirations to do that type of thing, but he wasn't, he was the eldest son and there was a family business that he had to run and there was kind of um, expectations upon him that weren't upon me. So I think, I don't think in any way he pushed me, but I think he saw those same interests in me. And I don't come from a creative family at all. There's no artists and there was no like, this can be possible kind of thing. So he was very like, also, when I did go to uni, it wasn't to study art, it was to study graphic design because he was like, you will get a job. There is no mm-hmm. like creative artist, starving artist. That's not allowed. Like You have to get a job at the end of it, especially because um, higher education is expensive. But yeah, it was very, um, I was very much allowed to be creative as a kid. But they uh, instilled in you the practical side of art, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. It was... Um, yeah it wasn't just a free pass I remember I remember when I finished um my graphic design degree as well I had a, having a conversation with my dad and I was like so I think what I need to do now is a master's which is like a very kind of I'm scared I don't know what to do next and he was like no no mm. no now you get a job <laughs> I was like okay yeah. you're just like how long can I prolong yeah. not going into the real <laughs> exactly. world exactly I don't know what I'm doing, so I probably need to stay at uni. <laughs> and yeah, he was having none of that. And for years, I actually thought I would go back to uni. And then I went freelance instead. And I, I think that was like a whole other learning experience for me. So I think now I don't feel that need or urge because I'm doing the things that I want to do. And so um, but you, from what I, from what I remember, if, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, was it before you went freelance or did you go freelance and then you started working with fashion brands, didn't you? So my so so with the whole get a job in mind, I was very I was unemployed for a bit after uni, but a girl I was good friends with was on the textiles course of my uni and she'd got a job with H and M, which I thought was the coolest thing on the planet. And she was letting all her textiles buddies um, go and have interviews and passing on their portfolios. So I was like, hang on, I want to do that too. And I ended up getting on the graduate scheme, the graduate scheme with them. So I actually went straight into fashion, high street fashion. And I worked in Stockholm for a year. Then I moved back to the UK and I worked for a bunch of different um, high street brands that are British. So I did about seven years of working in high street fashion. And then when I went freelance, I I continued on because that was my vocation then. So I went freelance and worked um, as a freelancer for different brands. And then that allowed me to kind of gradually sidestep into illustration because I realized it was like a slow realization that actually to do the things that I wanted to do sort of pattern and surface pattern design wasn't everything I needed to kind of branch out into more stuff and also I needed to kind of uncouple myself from the ideas that had been instilled in me and approach pattern in a fresh and different way so like move past all the kind of um quick and commercial and sort of yeah different to what I do now but but that also Mm. the foundations of what I do now how so so well, I mean, when I when I started, I had I didn't have a clue, <laughs> and um, they taught me how to put things into a P, and they taught me about color, and they taught me about yeah commerciality, like making a design that will sell. Definitely was you know it was a learning a learning curve, and that's important. You can't. It's great to just make stuff you love, but you, you kind of need someone to buy it. <laughs> Or you can't keep on making it. Yeah. So um, all those kind of foundations, yeah. Did you feel like you didn't have that a grasp on that when you left uni? So I remember like one of my early feedbacks being like, you're really good at commercial design in H&M, but I didn't have any confidence. I didn't know what I was doing. And when I left H&M, I tried going freelance, but I still, I, I really lacked confidence. I really was quite crippled by I'm not sure what I'm doing um and that stayed with me for quite some time so it it took years of working for other people and sort of building confidence and then it took years as a freelancer to kind of 
just learn to listen to my inner voice and and sort of keep on pushing away at an idea and listen to the kind of feedback in my head rather than needing kind of someone else to tell me what to do. So what did they what were you doing exactly working for H&M? Were you designing actual product or were you design or were you, or were you just working in ads? Well, I how, worked you... uh, for the kids wear department. So I designed t-shirt placements and patterns for dresses. It was the girls wear. I think it was Okay. I can't actually remember what the age range was. Something like two to five or something like that. So kind of young girls and I'd help out on the boys department as well. And um, yeah, lots of um, designing fun graphic T-shirts. I think I think I got the job because I'd done a lot of T-shirts when I was at uni. Because graphic design, you do you might do some T-shirt things. And then mm -hmm. while I was doing the job, they taught me about how to make repeat patterns. And I do like you know like fruity patterns for summer dresses and things like that. It was a fun job. And that you felt that that sort of set you up for the next step of. Okay, now I can take what I've learned. Yeah, I um, think working with these fashion brands and 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 do it f for myself. Yeah, well, I don't think I think looking back, you kind of have that hindsight. But at the time, it was a frustration with fashion. I'd moved from kids wear and I'd gone into women's wear because I felt like there was more options. There's more um, kind of trends and and things would get varied more. So I moved into women's wear and was doing women's wear fashion. And then after a few years of that, you, you realize how cyclical it is. And in the winter you're doing stripes and I don't know, acorn prints. And in the summer you're doing flowers and it gets quite like, um, predictable. And then mm -hmm. I realized, no, I need to go, I need to go freelance and sort of I had a really good relationship with the brand I worked with. And so I'd, I'd go back in for them because they just didn't have enough people helping them. So when I went freelance, they'd just get me back on a day rate. And I'd that was great for me because I still had this kind of security of a job. Mm -hmm. And um, and then that gave me the time to kind of think. And I think what happened first was I was like, okay, I'm going to start putting patterns on my own products because pattern was what I did so I'd make like um stationery and put a pattern on the cover of the book in like a notebook and then I'd do like I think I did lampshades to start with and cushions and things like that so I started doing my own thing and selling them at markets and then doing markets I was like looking around and seeing other people that were more like illustrators and they were doing cards and prints and all of this stuff and that kind of intimidated me because i did, even though it's like a print it's kind of like a t-shirt placement but you kind of it takes a while to get your head around it <laughs> it does for me anyway so yeah so then I started kind of branching out and then from there it's I started getting commissioned as an illustrator because then you kind of are you have more strings to your bow is that the expression <laughs> so I wasn't just doing pattern and you got you got those commissions did, did you get those from exposure at these markets um yeah i must have done and from doing like social media it was early days of social media then and probably from getting featured on blogs and stuff like that like print and pattern and places like that um how did you find living in stockholm how you said you were there for a year yeah oh my god it's just the most beautiful city that's not like a city at all because it's all water it's all islands it's a capital city that's islands and then the islands are really green and i'd cycle around because it's all really cycle friendly very scandinavian um but mm -hmm. it's a funny it's a funny place because obviously their um weather and light is so extreme like in the summer it's light all the time and it's lovely and warm and then in the winter it's dark all the time and it's freezing cold but then it snows and it's really bright because the light reflects off the snow so it was completely different experience for me very different to the UK very different to London but um amazing it was a really really cool year I would have stayed for longer but I couldn't at the time yeah I'd only been there uh in the winter time so oh, I wow. didn't get to see all the I, I hear it's beautiful in the summer and spring mm. but I had I didn't get to experience did any you of that. see it in the snow yes oh it's no. so pretty yeah it's beautiful yeah. absolutely beautiful yeah it's funny as well because I was talking to a Swedish, there's loads of Swedish people in London. I was talking to a Swedish person at a play group the other day and we were talking about how crazy Swedish people are because they, they, I mean, British people are like this, but they're less extreme because our weather's less extreme. In the winter, they're completely, um, what's the word? Like 
snuggled up in their own homes, not leaving the house, being all higger and cozy. And then in the summertime, they mm-hmm. are crazy. It's like, who are you? It's like two different extremes. It's so funny. They're all like out in the park, swimming in the lake naked. I was like, who are these people? They're crazy. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Super active, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very outdoorsy. Though actually, to be fair, in the winter, they do a lot of um, sports like I didn't get involved, but, you know, like skating and this cross-country skiing is very big there. Hmm. Um, and all the water, all the rivers, I suppose the, the, the water between the islands freezes over and you can go walking out on the ice, which is crazy. That sounds terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> but there's loads of people doing it, so you know it's safe, but it's still weird. Mm. So, what what year was that around? Like how long? Oh, how long that ago must have been that? 2010. Should... I left, so it would have been 2009, 2010. I graduated in 2008. And so, what what point did the? Because um, you said it, when you started getting some your first sort of freelance or uh, commission work, mm. it was at you were getting some of it through social media. What, around what time sure. was that? Well, what happened was I applied to this thing with my older uni. I went to the University of the Arts London, and they had this thing. I, this was when I was making products, um, but I didn't really know what to do with them except for market stores. And there was this opportunity to be part of a trade show, which is called Top Draw. And um, so I applied, and I got a little a little plinth basically with other people who are graduates of the uni and who are making products. And as part of getting a, a, a little a little spot on this group stand, you got this training. This was 2015, I think. And the part of the training was like a series of talks, how to wholesale, how to, I don't know, all these different things that were relevant, how to like do a trade show kind of thing, how to price your products, et cetera. Mm. And um, one of the talks was about this kind of stuff and a big section of it was social media, which honestly I didn't really know what it was. So weirdly I had downloaded Instagram and then done nothing with it. I think one of my techie friends had told me, oh, you should do this. And then I just not done anything with it. So then I, so around 2015, I started using it. But I, I don't think I really figured out its full potential until mm-hmm. probably the following year or the year after that. And then I became a bit obsessed with it because it was such a such a tool for a small person like me who could suddenly get all these be all these eyes on their products that I mean apart I'd had always used Pinterest and always been a fan of Pinterest, which is a kind of version of social mm-hmm. media, but more of a kind of visual Google, isn't it? But um, yeah, so so it was through that and that trade show that had um, got me into social media. It's definitely, um, it was initially a, a great platform for photographers and artists. I mean, that was... Oh, incredible. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely considered myself one of the lucky people who was on it at the right time. I pro- didn't probably... I didn't leverage it the way that other people did. I didn't see its potential in the way that other people did or use it enough, but I definitely used it in a way that like, I mean, massively helped me and, and just got me, that led to a lot of, there was a point in a couple of years where all the commissions I get would be through Instagram. Yeah. I mean, well, while everyone is taking pictures of their food, you're putting out art and like yeah. photographers are putting out amazing, you know, pictures sure. and stuff. And you really, at that point could stand out from, yeah. From the crowd in that way. Um, yeah. Do you still, are you still heavily active on social media? Or are you? Yeah. Out- well, it's been funny because it's been kind of a year off. I did sort of maybe post once a week, which probably sounds like a lot, but compared to like, I probably used to post like three times a week before. So I was maybe posting once a week in this year, but like Instagram has changed a lot in the past year. And now yeah. it's all about video. So now I'm like, okay, I need to put my, um, I don't know, glasses on and figure out what this is and how to do this. So I'm making very poor video content at the moment and will hopefully get better. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's always interesting with, with the artists is I, I think what always does really well are like um, sort of like time-lapse things that show the art being created from beginning yes. to end. Yeah, that stuff totally. is always so, so neat to watch. Yeah, this week I literally had a new, I don't know what you'd call it, one of these um, 
clampy things that you can connect to your phone that I have had one for years but this is like a better one so I can get more on top of my page that I'm drawing on so that it's I before they oh, were like shooting a weird overhead. angle yeah like a straight yeah. overhead exactly like a bird's eye view so I'm practicing with that but um I find it difficult because I don't know how these people manage to not turn the paper because I like to turn the paper around and get my hand at different angles um so I'm trying to yeah I'm trying to do that so I I'm trying to film my sketchbook but then I often go from sketchbook to my computer so then I'm trying to video both and then I need to learn some uh sort of editing skills and then put it all together but I'm I'm my phone's a bit crashy at the minute because I keep taking all this video but I need to actually do something with it yeah it's it's one of the interesting things like you know you're an artist and now you have to learn how to be a you know a social media and tech person yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah. God, I don't have time for that. <laughs> totally. I mean, I remember having this frustration before, though, with photography and feeling like I don't know how to take photos. I don't know how to style photos. And now that's become second nature to me. And I do all my photography and styling. So it's like I do, I think I'm just in the kind of um, difficult first phase and hopefully – it's something that I can get to grips with. You'll get to grips with it right when Instagram changes to something oh, else. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't be doing any um, dancing videos. I do like to dance, but no one needs to see that. <laughs> yeah, that's behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah. or in a or very in a dark, dark club. room close to other people so they can't see. <laughs> right. Um, you were mentioning how you how you jump from um, from sketching to the computer and I was just curious, you know, I, I looked on your website, which is very cute, by the way. I love the little pencil mouse. That's oh, thank on it. you. It's new. So thank you. Uh, it looks great. Thank um, you. And I was noticing you had some references to drawing on the iPad. And then mm. you had some, uh, you know, obviously you do lots of stuff starting with pencil sketches. Is that right? Yes. So, yeah, I mean, I tried iPad. I actually think Procreate is really nice to work with. But I think because I'm so, I've am so, i spent so many years working on Photoshop, I am quite kind of stuck. It's like old dog new tricks. I, I kind of am a bit stuck in it. I, I have gotten my head around it, but, but then I've like not used it for ages. So if I picked it up now, I'd probably be rubbish at it. But um, what I've been doing since I've been back at work, I've been doing my... I always think that hand drawing is just because we've been hand drawing since we could pick up a pencil. That's always the easiest. So it's like I go with what's easiest and I use felt tips and crayons because I can layer them up and my, all my um, patterns that I have with you guys, they're all completely hand drawn because that's what I did for years and years. But what I would do with those is I would hand draw all the elements and then scan them in and then use Photoshop to cut everything out, create the repeat, um, duplicate elements, like make it look how I would want it to look. So it's like a fun combo of hand drawn, but then digitally kind of rendered. But now I do a lot of... Um, I still do that and I love doing that, but actually I have taken a break and I haven't been doing that so much because I really got into printmaking, silkscreen printing and risograph printing. So to do that, you kind of have to, so I'd sketch and then you have to kind of hand draw everything because you need these, you need these layers that are print ready because you need, you separate every color out. I, I don't know if this is making any sense, but I do a lot of hand drawing in Photoshop, just working on top of my sketches so that I can then separate out colors and, and send things to print kind of thing or, or hand print them myself. But yeah, I, I like a combo of the two. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I actually, I'll probably ask you to elaborate a little bit more on that because, um, it is interesting talking to different artists and everyone's got their own method. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I find it, you know, you, you, with that, with the majority of the designs you have, it is really nice that and they, I feel like they lend themselves to the, the hand sketch, hand drawn. Yeah. look. I mean, it's, they're very, um, it has that human element. To yes. It. Yeah. Totally. You know, whereas a lot of times I suppose if you're drawing, within an iPad or, or something like that, I, I guess there's always the risk of 
making it too perfect. Agreed. Yeah, I totally and agree. Too um, clean. Maybe too symmetrical yes. or, or, yeah, too clean. Mm -hmm. And the art that you're doing and a lot of the designs that are on the Milton and King wallpapers, they're all very, they feel like you're getting something that was just drawn on the paper right in front of you. Totally. Um, yeah. Which is very, very cool. Just to, I guess, dive in a little bit more on that process. So you're, I, is it different every time or is it you're doing your sketches and then you're, how do you get it? How do you get your sketch into Photoshop? Are you just scanning it on a computer and then drawing over top of it in Photoshop? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically I, it's completely um, down to what the final product is. So if I was doing a wallpaper, I would always approach it the way that I've approached all the wallpapers that are with you guys, because I think that's, the right way to do it because it's digitally printed you like you said you want that hand element so if i um then ha like then drew it all on photoshop it would come out too clean and um hard edged for me so so yeah when it's the wallpaper i'm gonna like do all my hand drawings i use i'm like one of these people who just uses really like basic printer paper um, just do my drawings on that. And then my printer has a scanner on the top of it. So I just scan on that, import everything into Photoshop. And then I literally use the lasso tool on like a, like a feather. So it's got a very tiny feather. So it's got a smooth edge. It's not a very hard, like, like pixelated edge. So I use like a one pixel feather or something like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, cut everything out. By hand, I use a Wacom tablet because it makes everything much easier for stuff like that. And then I um, sort of layer everything up. And with pat with pattern, you need to kind of build from the bottom up. And sort of so things like um, the woodland birds, I can see everything sitting sort of slightly behind everything. As you go up, everything's sitting behind each other. So I use the layers to make that kind of look like you're looking through a scene kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so, but then if I'm, so at the moment I'm designing some cards, because I haven't done cards in ages, which are going to be printed small and on like a kind of nice textured paper. And for that, because they're going to be printed so small, if I, I tried a test with just hand drawn, but it's too um, sort of messy and you can't actually see the design that well. So actually I'm hand, re hand drawing everything in Photoshop and maybe adding a little bit of texture to get that hand element. Um, and I use a pen that kind of um, tapers so that you get like a, you never get an even straight pen. It, it always tapers and looks a little bit more natural. Um, but yeah, so they essentially will be digital, but drawn over hand-drawn sketches. So they will retain a bit of the hand-drawn element. But it, this is the scale is really important of what product you're working on. So it, before I start working on something, I'm looking at, I'm thinking about the scale. Is it a big wallpaper or is it a small card? And what's right for getting the design across on that scale? So at this point, because you're scanning it in and you're working on just, um, I guess, regular like typing paper, right? Regular, regular mm -hmm. printing paper. Does that mean you haven't really done anything that's where the, where the item or the thing, the ob object you're drawing is not bigger than like an A4 size at yeah. this point? Yeah. 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 I think, I don't know. I don't know why, but for some reason that I've managed to get away with that. I don't know how. So the, the wallpapers that you have are, they're larger than my original drawings, but, but because my original drawings are quite detailed, I think they can, they can take being scaled up a bit. Okay. So they are blown up. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm. Okay. Yeah, because the the repeat size that I've created, they I think what's happened is they've been blown up to meet the size of the wallpaper width, but for some reason I've managed to get away with it. But I think it's because also if there's a lot of elements and they're all drawn on an A4 piece of paper, once you collage all those elements together, that's actually quite big. Mm -hmm. mm. And so, are you creating the pattern repeat in Photoshop? You're yes. creating the repeat yourself. Yes. Yeah, because so many years doing repeat patterns. So I normally do like a square or a rectangle. And then I just, I don't know how much detail. Do you want me to go into the, that detail? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd, I think, um, you know, especially other aspiring artists and stuff mm. would find this really interesting. I mean, I don't know that my technique is necessarily the best, but it's the way that I do it. And I, if, if I even look at someone else and how they do it, I'm like, no, I can't handle it. Um, so I do like a square or a, a, a rectangle. And then I pull the guides in. So that the guides are a couple of centimetres in on each side. And then when I start repeat, I always start with the corner because whatever element you put in the corner is in every corner. So that begins to help. Or, so you can either do that or you can build a repeat how you want it to look. And actually, that's probably a better way of doing it. And you get things, you get all your elements so that you've got everything re- happening once or however many times you want it and, and it's looking right. And then you would group everything and then you would copy that group, flatten it, and you'd pull it down and get it so, so that it's slotting below. So you've got an exact copy below and it, it sort of meets and it's about right. And then you're going to pull a guide down to the exact same spot on each group. So the top of this bird's head and the top of this bird's head. And then you're going to um, copy both of those and either flatten them or keep them as layers so that you can tweak things and and go across instead of down and, until you're happy. And what you'll end up with is four things but with a little bit of a gap in the middle of all four but then once you've pulled your guides so you pull your guides to again so say you've got one obvious element you zoom right in and you pull your guide so you've got guides going down horizontally from when you went down and now you do the same thing vertically to the same element and then on the other side to the same element. Now, if you grouped everything and moved it around, you could get that gap to be in the middle of your square. So everything around the edges is probably repeating now. Already it's done. So Mm -hmm. all you need to do now is duplicate some elements and fill in that little space in the middle with whatever extra element you want. And I do a bit of like, I don't know, I like this element, so I'll just flip it over. But I mean, that's that's how you could do it. Or you could do the thing where you create all your guides and then and so like something like a polka dot I'm just going to shove a polka dot in the corner and the other corner and down again and then put one polka dot in the middle and then you've got like a polka dot print but with things Mm -hmm. like um like the New York pattern that's a bit trickier so with that it all has to meet up because it's like architectural and all the lines have to make sense so with that i would have built it all in fact I think I drew it all um a little bit already not in repeat exactly but I I drew two chunks that sort of made sense already and then put them together and then I think I probably would have filled in the gap with a new bit of drawing like I would have printed out that um that kind of diamond bit that's missing in the middle and then hand drawn that in and then scanned that bit in and then and then filled that in kind of thing wow i th- I find that fascinating um when it comes to um this whole process do you find it's a different sort of part of your brain i guess that you're working with when you're sitting there just being creative and you're sketching something out that you think is cool mm. and then you get to the point where it's like where you're talking about scanning into photoshop and kind of doing the copy and paste and moving things around do you find that that it's all part of the same artistic process or is it okay now that i've done the creative drawing aspect i have to get into the computer aspect of it and that's just a whole different mm, yeah i think probably um when i was first doing pattern i found i remember finding it very difficult and being like my brain is not a mass brain i can't do this especially because we'd have to design patterns for printing so we'd have to design them for the roller whereas you guys digitally print so it it doesn't matter which is nice but um so but but if I'm so to to, sorry to answer your question better if I'm designing a pattern I'm thinking about the pattern before I'm even starting drawing because I'm thinking about what is the angle what like what is the perspective on the pattern so I have patterns that just kind of go up and down like my plants and things like that or objects where they're quite loose and then I have like more botanical patterns where things have to match up like um my Amazon pattern that that was a real mind bender because 
everything's linking up a little bit and you have to make that link so that that's quite difficult when it's kind of loose objects like my matchbooks and things like that that's a, a lot easier I don't have to think about that so much but with things like Palm Springs and New York I have a thing called an isometric pad and that gives you the basic grid which is like a triangle grid which then gives you that perspective so I'm going to do all my drawing um I I don't actually draw on the isometric to save the paper I'll put the isometric on say like a light box and then I'll put my crappy printer paper on top of it so that I can make sure that I'm drawing everything so that it's going to slot together right and mm -hmm. look like it's in the right perspective yeah, I saw something on your website where it showed some of the objects you were drawing, like on a graph paper. Mm. And I'm, as, I'm guessing that's for scale and yes, you know, sym symmetry. Yeah. And... yeah, yeah, yeah. It helps keep the scale sort of making sense as well. But yeah, I think with the Palm Springs, that was the first time I'd approached pattern in that way. But I'd, I've always been sort of a fan of, you know, E Boy, who does a mm -hmm. lot of everything he does is isometric and and sort of bit mapped and um i don't know if it was him or someone else where i'd seen oh if you work to this isometric grid you can actually and i'd suddenly sort of pinged in my head he doesn't do pattern he just kind of draws these whole huge scapes that belong in this world but actually it pinged in my head oh this is a really great way to make a pattern because it's all gonna slot together perfectly mm -hmm. um as you repeat so then i got really into that and um, yeah, I should do more like that because they're really fun to do, but they are a bit of a brain melter. Yeah, I can I can imagine just the those two sort of functions just requiring just a different part of your brain going from the creative. Mm, well, it's still definitely. creative, but it's there's just more of a, a technical Planning. know how to it. Yeah, and um, yeah, definitely. I know that that can be a hard. Um, adjustment or a hard shift for an artist to do um totally I mean I'm lucky because I had all these years of training uh, doing patterns so I, I I can bang out a polka dot in in five seconds because I've done so many variations on a polka dot and when you have those kind of basics down then it's easier to do a floral or a whatever and then yeah so then I think when I started sort of playing with pattern after being freelance for a bit, I started really kind of pushing actually what kind of pattern could I do and making them more like a bit bonkers. And I'm a big fan. And it started in um, Sweden. There's this um, pattern designer called Joseph Frank that a lot of people are very into. And he really sort of pushed ideas about what pattern can be. And he worked a lot for this brand called Svensk 10. <clears throat> and yeah, I'm a big fan of him and how he sort of he does a lot of organic patterns and th and they sort of link together really cleverly and they contain really like unexpected elements and yeah they're really cool um i wanted to get into a little bit of um of of the specific designs um like um you know i i found like woodland birds for example is yeah. probably always within like the top five most popular designs that we sell it's it's gotta it's gotta wow, be it's, crazy. it's gotta be in the top five it's always every once in a while i'll check because sometimes i'll update um the best sellers on on the website and that's always up there um mm. but i find it very that one in hawthorne which is also a bird, bird mm. design very different than all the yeah, other designs totally. that you do. Um, yeah. Like, I, I don't know if I would even, if I just saw it, I wouldn't. You wouldn't think they were related. I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't <laughs> guess that this is a Jacqueline Colley design from, from knowing all the other designs. Like, if I think of Palm totally. Springs or Yucatan or, you know. Yeah. It's Well, so it's because, I, I totally agree, and it's because when I first left um, my job in, 
freelance, um, when I first left my job in textile design, one of the first, or some of the first patterns I did was, I'd been, where had I been? I'd been to Morocco and I'd seen all these cacti and I did all these cacti prints and I was really into them and they were really different and you, you have a cacti wallpaper and it's got palms and things and I was really excited by this. And then I was like, I was in my old mind frame of working in fashion for so many years and I was like, cool, I've done a summer print, now I have to do a winter print. Mm. And so then I was like, right, I'm going to research... Um, what are the birds, you know, UK birds and um, what's what's all the native flora. And I had this book that I've had for ages that has all this kind of British flora and fauna in it. So I was like in this old mind frame of I must do summer and then I must do winter. And I made those prints and then I didn't, it's, it's like quite sad, but I didn't love them that much. Mm -hmm. And they didn't really feel like a reflection of me, but they, they're still good prints and they're still kind of like I enjoy I really enjoyed drawing the birds like the pheasant with all these amazing colors in its like coat um but I didn't I did make some products I think I made tea towels but I think even then I was like this isn't me but I think I was so caught up in the must make a floral must make a winter bird like must be seasonal and then I think from doing them I kind of managed to kind of see it, it's hard to kind of when you've worked for so many years in a certain industry and you have all these kind of um ways of working instilled in you and then you're kind of this loose gun and you don't know what to do with yourself mm -hmm. and you're a bit like I need to make some work to share and to show people what I can do and I think it was part frustration with we do so many bird prints but I'd never love them and they'd all never be that interesting so I was like, I'm going to make a bird print that I really like stand by. Mm -hmm. But then, and then I think I moved away from all of that. And I was like, I'm actually, I, I think I did the house plants next. And that was really like back to the cacti, like fun and organic, but in a different way, like prints that wouldn't be on a garment in a, in a store, prints that felt different, or at least did at the time anyway. Right. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you. It's funny. I look at the prints that you have on, um, on Milton and King and it's like a, a path through my creative psyche as I'm like finding my way. <laughs> but yeah. That must be interesting to see because it is just sort of, it, you know, as an artist, it just sort of marks your evolution as an mm. artist and your creative, you know, your creative path. But totally. yeah, I mean, people love that, that Woodland Birds one. I, I'm, not that I'm surprised, but I've just, I've just always, just the fact that it's just always in the top. I go, wow. Yeah. That's really, that really, crazy. really cool. It, it's really crazy because I made it with that commercial head on. So it kind of does make sense. But also I was reacting against the, that commercial kind of bird print and doing something different. Mm -hmm. But so, but obviously it wasn't that <laughs> different, but yeah, it's, it's funny. It's good. It's good that it's so popular though. And, but it's, but now I I so rarely make like seasonal work. I just live in summer now, <laughs> or I yeah. live in like mid century quirky America world. I don't really I don't really do that kind of season. I just do stuff that make like we were talking about at the beginning stuff that brings me joy, stuff that's playful. And yeah, I definitely have moved away from that kind of ticking boxes, doing seasonal and kind of yeah. I suppose fulfilling things for a client. I now just kind of fulfill things for myself. Well, that's so awesome that you can do that. Um, yeah, I mean, totally. It's a privilege. It does feel like you've found this style and aesthetic that's very unique to you. Um, and I always think it's interesting, and I only really find out when I do a bit more research, that oh, like things like Road Trip or New York or Yucatan, they all come from... Uh, like I don't know if you you go there looking for things, but they all come from your real life, like actual trips mm, that, you, yeah. you, that you've done. So I don't know if it's do you do you um, want to do these things and go there to get inspiration, or do you just happen to be going there on a on a vacation and you go, wow, this is neat, this is neat. I'm going to go back and draw this stuff. Yeah, I think it's probably a little bit of both because when you're on. Um, holiday not anymore because I have a baby when you're on holiday you have a lot more time and you can I always take a sketchbook with me and I and I'm not great at working in a sketchbook the rest of the time but 
on holiday you can just sit in a cafe and and draw and be inspired and it's that weird thing like that you know that expression like being a tourist in your own home Mm -hmm. it's quite hard to be a tourist and have that kind of I have a friend who's really good at it and when I meet up with her with she'll really help me like see our beautiful city in in those kind of fresh tourist eyes which I think is kind of a skill to do in your own home but when you go abroad things smell different things taste different and it's like your senses are kind of awakened and um it definitely started with that um cacti print because we'd been to these stunning stunning gardens in marrakesh called les jardins Marjorelle, and i'd sat in these gardens drawing the cacti and the palms and i just felt so inspired and um I think, you know, as a student and stuff, you're always encouraged to document. And, and But I think that was at a time when I was, I'd been working in this commercial job that was a creative job, but maybe the, the creativity part had been um, a little bit siphoned away because you're trying to make another bestseller or, or do a version of this or a version of that. And it was like a trip that really made me just, I was drawing lots of the um, rock and tiles things that were really stunning. And yeah, it was a trip that was just being creative. And I think I was about to leave that job or I was, or I knew I was going to leave that job soon and I was going to go, go freelance. And then a few years later, like quite, quite a few years later, we went to California on a road trip, which is something I've always wanted to do. And my part, like when we got, when we got back to, from Morocco, my partner bought a map and was like, yeah, we're going. But he really struggles with um, a fear of flying. That's actually quite, quite a serious problem. And um, then the excuses kept on happening we just and we kept putting it off and putting it off and then he discovered that if he goes to the gp and asks for um a little bit of help they give you um diazepam so oh, wow. that's the only way he'll get on a flight so we were so then it took a few years of sort of like figuring out how we're going to do because it's a very long flight um for us to california and we did we planned out this whole trip of all these different places we were going to go and i'd seen pictures of salvation mountain and palm springs and i was obsessed and um yeah we hired a car and did that very american road trip thing and it was just so super inspiring we've been thinking about it for so long and yeah I mean my sketchbook went with me and did loads I mean I also am a massive um I take loads of photos I love taking photos because photos are so useful for references for drawing Mm -hmm. um so yeah taking lots of photos too and then the Palm Springs one was a real like yeah place places can really inspire me and also I got massively into all your um what is it like flea markets and antique shops and there's so much cool paper ephemera that's like from the mid-century that's all been like silkscreen printed and litho printed and it's like artwork in itself so we were like hitting all of those kind of shops and collecting all this like bizarre stationery and paper ephemera and getting carried away but um yeah so that that trip inspired me for a really long time (laughs) and it still inspires me now did you um for did have you been in New York City and I'm assuming that's why that inspired you to do that one as well? Yeah, yeah, no, a good friend of mine who I grew up with, she lives in New York and has done for years and she got fed up with me and was like, You have to come and visit now because I've lived here for like five years or something. So I was like, Right, we go. And I mean obviously I want to go to New York City anyway. It's like the, you know, it's iconic, like all these movies are there. So we decided that when we were there, we we're gonna go and see like the Ghostbusters building and yeah. obviously you go and see you go and see the Empire State building and the Chrysler and all of this kind of stuff. And I was taking all these photos and I was thinking about all these movies. Like it just you feel like you're in a film walking around New York. You feel like yeah. either like some massive disaster's about to happen. <laughs> or like aliens are about to land or something like this so I was like um really thinking about the pop culture of New York and then I think I must have been I'm trying to think what was in my sketchbook yeah I was definitely drawing like King Kong and things like this so Mm -hmm. then when I got home I was thinking about I think I had the idea while I was there like I need to do you know Statue of Liberty walking down the walking through the city and stuff like that like ghostbusters and yeah like a like a homage to pop culture in new york yeah there's there's so much cool uh so many cool things to look at in that design like i feel like you can kind of just look at it and you find some eye candy yeah you know like i 
you know, the the chocolate bar on the top of the apartment building or, you know. Yeah, I love, and there's you know, a little, little UFO. hot coffee, which makes me think of Elf when it's like the best coffee in town. Right, world's or, best coffee. Yeah, yeah, world's best coffee, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, so all those cool. little yeah, that print definitely feels like the most that that felt like a real as an artist, like a real um sort of light bulb moment of these are all the things I love and I can just put them all in a print and there are no rules. I can just do that if I want to. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so that was a real that was a print that really made me yeah. F- help me find my style I think I'm always I feel like I'm always kind of on a journey with figuring out but but now I definitely feel much more at home and it is the fun and you know everything plus the kitchen sink is in there and yeah it's very me I mean you got a pizza slice on the side of a building a donut a hot yeah. dog a pretzel <laughs> is just on top it's just it's uh I I have noticed uh, a lot of people that it's also a very popular design and I've noticed that a lot of people who choose to get it either you know also fell in love with a trip to new york but it's yes. a lot of people yeah, that either yeah. kind of left the city yeah and so a lot of times they'll have lived in new york when they were younger or whatever and they had kids and they moved kind of more in the yeah. suburbs or whatever it is and they always just find that got um, a piece of it yeah they got a piece of their love of new york city that they've yeah. taken to their home in the countryside or whatever it yeah. is. yeah i've seen a lot of very jazzy small toilets which i think is great like a real sensory overload yeah Exactly. Um, my personal favorite of all your designs is the matchbooks. Oh, yeah. Um, I feel like it doesn't get enough attention. I agree. Or something, but everything, at least the, I like the, mostly the initial colorway that's on the, the yeah. more aqua background. Yeah. There's just something about it. And, you know, I don't smoke or anything, but I I look at it and I just, I don't know, it's... Yeah, the that, color yeah. and the kind of retro aesthetic to it. And, and almost it almost just seems like a time that's no longer there. Like, mm. I don't even know the last time I've seen a real matchbook anymore. Everyone's, yeah, you know, true. got their little, their lighters or whatever it is. But there is something just very nostalgic about it and very, like, Route 66 about it. Yeah. Well, that I is, fr- I think that, I think that, no, it's definitely when we were on the East Coast and when we went to New York, we bought, we were again hitting all the flea markets and all the antique shops. And uh, we bought like a whole big, I don't know, not that big, but like a sort of plastic bag full of matchbooks and match um, matchboxes. And that a lot of them are very like motel ones that you pick mm-hmm. up and and they're free and they're handed out and some of them are like some of them were more recent and some of them were all more old but like this is what i mean about the ephemera that you can pick up in the u.s like i don't know where it is in the uk either we don't have it or it's gone or you you don't find people collecting these kind of paper like i am but i don't see it sort of elsewhere like um, in antique shops are filled with sort of like big brown ugly furniture there's not a lot of like whereas you go you go to an antique shop in the US and there'll be stands where you can just flick through all this kind of paper ephemera of just deliciousness and I we bought this bat with this bag just filled with matchboxes and we bought you know individual ones as well and, and other like bits and bobs here and there and then I think when I came home I don't know if it was before the New York one or after but I remember like just sitting down and just drawing them because I was obsessed I just thought they were so cool and they're so I agree with you they're so of a time when they were like the advertise. They were like the advertising used by bars and restaurants and hotels, mm. and and they're just yeah. they're, they're just visual, just delights. It's <laughs> just so good. Yeah, I love it so much. Um, the other one that it's you know it's a bit weird f- for me, but I I still I don't know what it is. There's something about it I love is the 1980s office wallpaper. And maybe it's just because <laughs> yeah. I'm reminiscing from early early childhood or something i don't know but um yeah that there's something about that, that just it's it feels like a it it reminds me of um i don't know like a 17 or 18 year old at their first job yeah like there's something very teen about totally. it totally yeah and and then also but very like this is my first job and i just don't know where anything goes <laughs> kind of thing yes um, yeah but I, but I love it because it just has all those cool elements um, to it. I mean, even things that, you know, 
you don't like the old school computer that look, looks like a you know the old school box computers yeah. and the 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 leopard print glasses and then the calculator and just all these like the floppy disk yeah you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I There's just, it, just something about it. Yeah, I think it started with the computer. I was like, I really want to draw a computer, like the first computers that I ever used and that were in my school or whatever. And I didn't even know what I was doing. I was probably just playing games on them. And um, from there, it just kind of, I don't know. I think I had, I, that was definitely just a personal project. I've got, I've always had a stationary obsession. I love stationary and yeah it, I don't know where that came from it was obviously just like in me I had to get it out <laughs> I had to yeah. draw it and it's a lot of I can look at it and see things I can see my scissors and my glasses <laughs> and my bulldog clips and yeah it's so funny it's like uh but I think it all started with this computer I think I'd seen a computer somewhere and it really was like that's got to be a print like that's got to be a pattern Going back to the matchbooks, I think I saw something on your site that you did it as a mural. Yeah, that right? yeah, that one. So what came first, the mural or the the wallpaper design? So the mural. So all the elements that are there, they're actually all massive. So I drew, each one of them is an A4 sort of sketch. So I think I drew them all and then, yeah, it must have been the mural. I think I did a print as well, but I must have drawn them massive because I was going to make, going to do the mural. I just wanted to have a go at doing a mural. <laughs> But, um, and so is that still up somewhere that oh, someone can no, go walk and I see? I don't think it lasted that long. It probably only lasted a few months because it was global street art and they just sort of like let you have a, like a, oh, it was okay. like a building site. In fact, the building is almost finished now, I think, because it was quite a while ago. They, they were they were building it forever. But it was the hoardings all around the building site and mm. they were always covered in art because these people managed them and yeah, I just wanted to have a go and I got together with some friends who also have a match matchbox book obsession. So my friend Alicia did one and my friend Natasha did like a um she did like a, a dot pattern inspired by the strike paper. Um so we did like a little collective love of matchbooks. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, it was fun. It was very cold. <laughs> but yeah, it was fun. Have you have you done much any other kind of like street murals or anything like that, or well, was that the only one? I got. I had a really fun opportunity, which was to do a the doors of Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is a really famous hospital in London because they look after children. They're really specialised in looking after children, and they had this theme of biophilia, which is all about how plants kind of heal us. Even looking at pictures of plants, um, it can it's good, like just good for you. It has a good effect on you. So I did like a really. Um, planty jungly animals there's these like sliding doors and there's two sets of them so I did like um kind of enter the jungle <laughs> kind of vibe mm -hmm. but it was up for like maybe a year and it was literally just as covid hit so I don't know how many people saw it because um people wouldn't mm. have been going out or to the hospital but what's nice is that the people who were were probably very sick or their kids were or their siblings were so it was a really nice project because it was like putting smiles on kids faces which was yeah really good that's the best yeah it was that was the best job yeah well i've taken up a lot of your time um i don't want to keep you for too much longer we've been going for a little over an hour oh wow but um i just um i think it's so great that you know it feels like with your designs, you've really found your stride and your style. And I love that you um, are to the point where you're just saying, like, I'm just going to put everything I love yeah. <laughs> in this Don't design. Hold back. I, just think, I do. Well, I think it's so cool because there's a, there's a certain freedom in that. Totally. And it ends up representing so much of your, your personality, which is what I find the most um, appealing thing about really any art. You know, I, you can have something um, attractive, or beautiful on your wall, or, or you know, whether it's wallpaper or, or a photo or anything. But I, I always find it, what makes it truly special is you're getting a piece of that person that created it. You're getting part of their personality, part of the things that they love. And I don't know, there's something truly, truly special about it. And I think it's great that, you know, even though it's 
it's just wallpaper. It's still, it's part of, it's Jacqueline Colley's. <laughs> You're getting, you know, her artistic insight and the things that she loves. And I think that's, I don't know, I think that's really great. Yeah. Oh, I think, it, well, I just think it's great that, yeah, using my designs because, I mean, for so many years, I just wanted so desperately to do wallpaper. So it's still, for me now, a pinch me moment that people put the, my designs on their walls, like... I cannot believe yeah. that when I see those photos on Instagram, it's like these beautiful bathrooms that people have created. Like, I can't believe that they've used my design. And not only that, but they like up level it by having it in these cool spaces. Like, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And they use, you know, they, they, they paint the entire bathroom based on a color that's yeah, you decided yeah. in your they art. They picked it out. It's so cool. Yeah. Do you have any, before I let you go, do you have any, advice or anything for um artists like yourself that maybe are just getting into you know uh, just starting on their sort of artistic path and maybe you know are considering doing you know surface pattern stuff mm. or yes doing stuff for wallpaper or, or or not just just you know anything to that you know person that maybe where is where you were just getting out of uni and trying to figure out what the heck to do with their uh their talent yeah totally I mean I think you can hear from my story how I've sort of pinged about with not that much um I don't know planning or destination in mind and I think it's I think I wasn't that good at listening to that inner voice and and following my instincts so always good to do that and like always good to just like take the knockbacks and keep going because there's just a lot of knockbacks and and that's fine that's part of the process um, so yeah, just keep, keep sending out those emails and not hearing back. I still get that now. It's totally fine. And just, yeah, keep going. Do you still do, um, commission work and people still hire you to create something or is it, um, or do you not do much of that? No, I, I do do it. Um, I, I'm in a privileged position where I can be really fussy basically. And I have clients that I kind of, um, I have clients who are expecting something from me maybe in the future, but they'll get it. They're not in a rush. So so I might pitch mm -hmm. an idea and then work on it when I have time. And I do get um I do get um inquiries, but I only take things on if I feel like it's a really good match and I just listen to that in the voice and I know almost immediately if something's right for me or not. Um and I also still, you know, collaborate with other small creatives because I always think that's a really, um, um, what's the word? Like, it's a really like creative thing to do when you work with another small business and you, you're kind of combining your skill sets. Like that's always been a really like fertile ground for me. Um, so yeah, I do sort of like little collaborations and if like I, I don't get too stressed when I don't get any emails in my inbox because I manage my shop and I sell products and I, I wholesale products and I do a lot of like little things that all kind of work together and I don't do one thing all the time but it means I spend a lot of time thinking oh I'd love to do this or I'd love to do that but I don't always have the time to do it but um mm. but yeah I I, I I take on commissions when they feel right but, and I make more time for because I think the things like New York City um, pattern and things like that those are things that are just me just being creative and doing my thing and then they lead to projects so I think making time for your ideas and is really important because that's generally what leads to the good commissions well if people want to um check out your wallpaper they know that they can go to milton and king um and check out i think you've got somewhere close to 10 designs mm. i think um or they can visit your website jacquelinecolley.co.uk and you've got all sorts of stuff on there is mm -hmm. that right like you can you have a shop yeah. on there that you can get um uh, silk screen prints and Risso prints and yeah tea towels bits and bobs yeah that's so yeah. cool so yeah um if you're listening to this check out uh Jacqueline Colley's website um lots of cool things there it's stuff that's just all that kind of style that we absolutely love that has all that fun quirky um colorful um beauty to it um 
thank you so much for joining oh, me. Thank you. That was lovely. It was, I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And it's really interesting chatting things through. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate it.